In the late 1500s, a man named Tycho Brahe collected a lot of data. He made continuous observations of the sun and moon and planets for nearly 20 years. He was the data collector. When he died, hundreds of notebooks full of data were passed on to his assistant. Johann Kepler was his assistant, and Kepler was an interpreter. He really was able to take Brahe's data and make sense of all the measurements and condense them into solid ideas. Eventually, he came up with a series of three laws that explained planetary and orbital paths. His first law says that the orbital paths of the planets are elliptical with the sun at one focus. So the planets do not orbit the sun in a perfect circle. They travel in an ellipse with the sun as one focus of that ellipse. Now in order to draw an ellipse, you need two focus points. A perfect circle is a type of ellipse where the two points are in the same position, making each point along the circle the same distance from the focus. In an ellipse, the two points are some distance from each other, making the shape a bit flatter, where some points are closer to the center and others are further away. As the points move further apart, the ellipse becomes flatter and increases what we call eccentricity. Now a perfect circle has an eccentricity of zero. A straight line has an eccentricity of one. In terms of the solar system, planets orbit the sun in an elliptical shape and the sun is located at one of these foci. The same is true for the case of the moons and artificial satellites of the planets. In this case, the planet becomes one of the foci. This is actually a Cassini picture of Rhea and Epithemius in front of the rings of Saturn. It was taken about three quarters of a million miles away, and it's here just because. Kepler's second law says that an imaginary line connecting the sun to any planet sweeps out equal areas of the ellipse over equal intervals of time. All right, so this boils down to equal areas in equal time. Take the beginning location of a planet at the beginning of position A. Imagine a line drawn from the planet to the sun. As it moves through its orbit for a specified amount of time, that line covers a certain area in space as it moves through to the end position of A. If we compare the same planet's orbit in a different position, say C, over the same amount of time, then we find that the area covered by that imaginary string is the same as the area covered in position A. This turns out to be true at any position on the planet's orbit, as long as the time periods are the same. If we then compare the arc lengths of each position, we can deduce then that the planet was covering more linear distance at position C. This means that the planet must be traveling somewhat faster at the C portion of its orbit than it was at the A portion. Okay, so the Earth is traveling in an elliptical orbit around the Sun which means that when it is closer to the sun in its orbit, it is traveling at a higher velocity than when it is further away from the sun in its orbit. If you think about how gravity affects the orbit of the Earth, you can see how the change in velocity makes sense. So the Earth at any point in its orbit is traveling in a direction tangent to its orbit. Gravity is pulling the Earth towards the sun. If gravity is acting in the same general direction as, or less than 90 degrees to, the velocity, then the Earth will be speeding up. If Earth is on the other side of its orbit, gravity will be more in opposition to the velocity of the Earth and will cause the Earth to slow down. Now it's all about the math. Kepler analyzed an enormous amount of data and he was able to mathematically describe a planet's orbit. He came up with his third law that says the time for a planet to make a single orbit, t, is proportional to the distance between the planet and the sun to the three halves power. So if the period is proportional to the distance to the three halves power, then it must mean that it is equal to some constant times the distance to the three halves power. And that's pretty much all he was able to do. This idea was accepted by nearly everyone because the data really showed this relationship was true, but no one could really figure out what that constant actually was. Until a few decades later, along came Newton with his universal gravitation. He proposed that the force of gravity was actually providing the centripetal force that was keeping the planet in orbit. 
Now on the left side of the equation, we need to define some terms a bit more clearly. So let's call capital M the mass of the sun, and the lowercase m the mass of the planet. We also have the distance from our planet to its sun labeled as r. On the right side, we also have a lowercase m, but it is actually the mass of the planet or it is the mass of the sun. Well, we know that centripetal force is causing an acceleration on the planet. So the mass of the planet should be what we want to use on the right side of the equation. So the mass of the planet cancels out and the single radius cancels out and we end up with a very simplified equation for the velocity of an orbiting body. Now this might not look like it helps us much, but if you remember way back to the beginning of this unit, you might recall that we did some things with the velocity in a circle. So guess what? We can plug this in. <laughs> and get this. No wonder Kepler didn't want to get to this part. So let's see what we can do with that. Well, originally we were trying to find an expression for the period of a planet, so let's go ahead and solve for t. We get t squared equal to 4 pi squared r cubed divided by the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the sun. <laughs> if you're still thinking that this doesn't really get us anywhere, you're probably not alone. However, remember that Kepler's relationship between the period of the orbit and the distance between the planets and the sun depended on some constant. We can pull out the 4 pi r squared over the gravitational constant and the mass of the sun. We can then convert that into the constant of proportionality that is needed to fulfill Kepler's equation. So the beautiful thing about this equation is that it holds true for every body in our solar system. Check out this table in your textbook. Pick any of those bodies and a satellite. This ratio will let you predict the orbit of any of them. This relationship has allowed us to predict where planets and moons might be orbiting around bodies not only in our solar system, but in systems around other stars as well. Now one thing that you might notice is that some of Jupiter's moons are a little bit off. This can be caused by other bodies orbiting in the same area and has actually allowed us to discover moons that we didn't know were there. So Kepler's third law says the period of a planet's orbit squared is proportional to the cube of its distance from the Sun. And this law has allowed the orbits of all of the planets in our solar system to be calculated. It has also allowed for the prediction of the location of other possible planets in other solar systems. Now one more really elegant idea to come out of Kepler's third law is the idea that since the equation contains a constant, planets within the same solar system can be compared to each other proportionally. So the ratios of the squares of the orbital periods of any two planets is equal to the ratios of the cube of the distances of those planets to the Sun. So given that the Moon orbits Earth every 27.3 days and that it is an average distance of 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters from the center of the Earth, calculate the period of an artificial satellite orbiting at an altitude of 1500 kilometers above Earth. So we have two satellites orbiting Earth, one natural and one artificial. Since they are orbiting the same body, we can use our proportion equation to find the orbital period of the satellite. We can define either one as our first body, but let's just go with the artificial satellite in this case. We also have a conversion issue to deal with since the distance for the satellite was given in kilometers and the distance for the moon was given in meters. This is as simple as moving the decimal place of the moon's distance three places to the right to give us 3.84 times 10 to the fifth kilometers. Oops, that should be a kilometer instead of a meter. I missed my label. Now a kind of sneaky thing to remember here is that we are dealing with a distance to the center of the orbiting bodies. So not only do we need to take into account the altitude of the orbit above the surface of the Earth, but also the distance to the center of the Earth. The orbiting distance of the satellite then becomes the altitude plus the radius of the Earth. So we take our 6,380 kilometers and we add our 1,500 kilometers and we get 7,880 kilometers as our distance from the center of the Earth to our orbiting satellite. So plugging this in and relying on that scientific calculator to get us through all of those exponents, we find that the orbital period of the satellite to be 0.080 days or 
1.93 hours.